what a contrast that we're going to enter. In fact, that begins it with a but, which is an adversive conjunction, which means what's going to be described is exactly the opposite of what had been described before. But when the kindness and the love of God, already you sense a whole different attitude that's being described. Luke 6 verse 35 says, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, and expect nothing back. And then your reward will be great in heaven, and you will be the sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and evil people. And because he is kind, we too must be kind. In other words, the God that we serve is the God that we imitate. Then it talks about the love of God. Well, the love of God is how that it appeared towards man. This is all really one word, and it's philanthropia. And you can see that this is the word for man, and phil comes from philos or phileo, which means to love. And so it's the love of man that is characteristic of our God. He's the grand philanthropist. Because he takes care of people, he provides for their needs, and he has a strong affection towards man. That's the man in general. Even the men that we have described here above, however bad they are, yet the love of God has appeared to to demonstrate how much God loves all of these men, regardless of how bad and evil and, and wicked they could be. God's love is still appears and manifests itself, demonstrating God's effect, affection and love for uh, these men. And that's the same attitude that we are to take as we relate to the same people. The next thing he talks about is that this love of God that has come and appeared has nothing to do with the works of righteousness, which we have done. Notice he includes himself in it, because the description that he's giving here is the uniqueness not only of God, but of the religion. Because this is why anyone who studies world religions recognizes that all religions are the same, except the biblical evangelical view of salvation. Because only in evangelical salvation is there the promise of not by any works of righteousness. There's nothing that man can do. If this is the description of what man is, whether more or less, it doesn't make any difference, one violation and you're guilty of all, then there's nothing that you can do to undo what you have done to become offensive to God. So therefore, it can't be by works of righteousness. Even though we may do some things that are nice, they're never going to undo even the one thing that we have done that made us guilty of all. Any salvation that is dependent on works, which is all religions in the world except evangelicalism, can never work. Because no one can be perfect and no one can live a life without violating one of the commands and therefore be made guilty of all of them. So the only way that it could possibly work is that a salvation be offered, and that's why it's so amazing the plan and wisdom of God, is that it's a salvation that can't be by works, which we have done. But rather, any works that we have done, on the contrary, the exact opposite, it's according to his mercy he saves us. Not by what we do, but by what he has done. And that is the most amazing part of the whole story. Paul describes this in Ephesians 2, among whom all of us formerly lived out our lives in the craving of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, but God rich in mercy because of his great love which he has loved us. So in spite of how we were, God in his amazing love demonstrated to us that he could still love us. And it's the only reason he could is because he himself paid the price for our sins so that he could accept us and love us. That is what is so amazing. And then when we look at how Paul responded, he was honest and transparent as well. Because as he described his testimony, he wrote it in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, and became one with him, no longer count, I no longer count on my righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I became righteous through faith in Christ. That I became righteous through faith in Christ. I love that there's a tense in, in Greek called the aorist tense. And it means an action that is one time. It's done. It's uh, not an ongoing action. It's an action that takes place and it's done. 
He says, I became righteous through faith. And that uses the aorist tense. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith, not on our actions, not on the attempt to do good works, which we can never do either good or enough good works. But he grants us his perfect righteousness, allowing us then to be fully acceptable to God. What a story. No wonder the gospel is so wonderful to try to tell everybody. And then, according to his mercy, he saved us. Notice also, there's another heiress tense, through the washing of regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So here we have, according to his mercy, he saved us, past tense. We're not going to be saved. He saved us in the past. But he did it through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That is, that the Holy Spirit does several operations when he becomes part of our lives. Notice how this plays out in the way it approaches to us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, born again, that is, we were born once uh, with a human spirit, and now we're born a second time with God's spirit. And so we have a new part of our being But it's not through corruptible seed, that is, through human conception, but through an incorruptible union through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So as the Word of God becomes part of our life, we engraft it into our heart and into our life by understanding it and believing it and accepting it. Then that acceptance of God's Word and His promises creates in us a regeneration. The Holy Spirit responds to that. As we respond to his word, he responds to us. And he comes with the washing of regeneration. Regeneration means a new life. And the new life is part of the incoming of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul writes, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. That is, once you have the Holy Spirit, you have a power within you to dominate and control that sinful nature. He says you are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ in them do not belong to him at all. There's a number of ways you can know whether you have the Holy Spirit or not. But the, the key is that the Holy Spirit will come within you. And when he does, there's a regeneration that takes place and a renewing of the Holy Spirit. That is, he comes in and dwells you. He's new into your being. And so in that sense, it's renewed in you. That is part of the amazing new life that comes within you. Paul says, 2 Corinthians five seventeen, that we're a new creature because Christ comes within us. If we have put our trust and belief in him, then we have the Holy Spirit. And all of those who put their trust in him will have that same Holy Spirit. That creates something within us. Notice in 2 Peter 1, 4, that through these things, that is the amazing promises that he's given us, he has bestowed on us precious and most magnificent promises. So now we're talking about the Word of God. So that by means of what, that is by the means of the promises, by understanding them and trusting in them, by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Wow. After escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desires, as we have seen here, here, by allowing the Holy Spirit to come within you, and that's what he's talking about here, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, literally the divine nature becomes part of our nature. It's, it's unbelievable. But that's what it means, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave now lives within us and gives us the power, therefore, to overcome the sinful nature that has so easily corrupted those who have no power within them to dominate the deception and the temptations of the flesh. But the Holy Spirit, as he comes, this washing of the regeneration and the renewing, says, whom he poured out on us abundantly. Well, we need to understand this passage in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen as to what the Holy Spirit does. Notice he says, for by one Spirit we were all, not some of us, but all of us, were baptized into one body. 
Now, I want to focus on the word baptism because we talk a lot about the baptism of the Spirit, but the word baptism is baptizo is a Greek word that they transliterate. They just take the letters from the Greek virtually and make an English word of it. It's not a translation at all. That's called a transliteration. The translation of the word means put into or to immerse or dipped, dipped in. So if we were to take now and instead of using the transliterated word of the Greek, and actually use a translation of the word, which is what it's supposed to be as a translation. Listen to how it reads. For by one spirit, we were all put into one body, or we were all immersed into one body, or we were all dipped in to one body. You see, what what is happening here, the Holy Spirit, it's not a question of how much power we have. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing to us to unite us with Christ and to come into us and become part of our lives. That's the operation of the baptism of the Spirit, is that he's putting us into the body of Christ. All believers, not some of them, all of them are put into one body. It has nothing to do with power or some ecstatic experience. It's, it's, the, un, it's the creation of the body. And it's taking all of the beautiful things of Christ and and putting us as disagreeable and, and awful sinners and putting us into Christ. And he paid for all of those awful things that we have done when he died on the cross. That's how his death becomes applicable to us because we become part of his death because we were put into him. And then his righteousness becomes ours because we are part of him, so all that's his now becomes ours. And that is what the work of the Holy Spirit does and what we call the baptism of the Spirit. And that is the idea, the regeneration and the renewing of the Spirit that he poured out on us abundantly. The Holy Spirit molding us and making us to become part of who he is. And that's the essence of salvation we really become part of him. And there's a sequence to how this happens. It says, now you Gentiles have heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you hear it, the proclamation of the gospel, you're hearing it. That's the power of God and part of what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's illuminating your mind. And when you come to the place that you, as you understand it through the power of the gospel and believe it, That's the second phase of it. And when you believe, he then identifies you or marks you, giving you the Holy Spirit. So you don't get the Holy Spirit until the third step of your salvation. But it happens as soon as you hear, understand, trust, believe, and then he gives you the Holy Spirit. And he comes and indwells you, and he indwells you forever. And he pours out on you abundantly. This is not just a casual uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. Notice what it says. He says, for in Christ lives all of the fullness of God. In other words, all there is of God lives in Christ in a human body. And so you also are complete through your union with Christ. Thankfully, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the immersion of the Holy Spirit putting us into Christ, into his body through our union with Christ, then now we have the fullness of God that lives within us, who's the head over every ruler and authority. The one who has absolute power and authority lives within us. Another verse Paul talks about, don't you know that you're the temple of God? Because he lives within you. But see, that's part of this incredible salvation. And then he says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the only way that it could ever happen. Remember, Jesus said this, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no man comes to the Father, that is, in the presence of heaven, except through me. There's no other way you trust in anyone else. It's in vain. The only one that you can trust in, only one that has any authority, only one that has any power, only one that has the right is Jesus Christ. And by trusting in him, we can have eternal life. And he's the one. What results in is that then, having been justified, 
by his grace. And justified here, this again is one of those uh, that's an aorist tense. It's a past action that's completed. The here is made perfectly righteous. That's what it means, declared perfectly righteous. And as he declares us, who's going to undeclare what he declares? And as he declares us right, because he gives us his righteousness. That's how he declares it, because we're united with him through the power of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit, we're united with him, so we are covered in his righteousness. And therefore, we have been, all of our sins have been paid for because he died on the cross, and we died in him on the cross. They've all been totally paid for. He adequately, justly, legally, in every way can say that we have been justified by his grace. And by his grace, it means that it's just the opposite. is not by anything that we have done, but it's just because of his, his love and his mercy. That's how he saved us. And he chose to make it that way because there was nothing that we could ever do. And so his grace was the only way that man could ever be saved. Wow, what a gospel. And that we should then, not only that, not only be saved. I mean, that's just the beginning of it. Because then he concludes saying that we should become heirs. Heirs are the ones that inherit everything. And Jesus was is the heir of, of all of creation. And because we're part of him, we become heirs with him to the hope of eternal life, life of the eternities. And that is that we will live forever with Jesus Christ. What a thrill. There's no question about it because we are part of him. The greatest hope forever is that we will live together with him. What a passage. No one, uh, Titus, was going to be thrilled to be able to share this with all of the people there on Crete. This was going to clarify the gospel in a way that they could really see people putting true faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross. We're just about to conclude the book of Titus. Stay with us.